We remember those of our soldiers, sail sailors, air airmen, and Marines who have not made it home, those folks who, are, uh, who never got out of uniform. And so that's what we're doing this weekend. Uh, but also, you know, having a barbecue and hopefully having a good time. So happy long weekend. Announcements. So uh, my wife severely admonished me. She said, do not forget. Today is the last day for ladies to sign up for the Women's Refresher event on Saturday at my house where you're going to tie-dye t-shirts. Did I... Tie dye with Tori. Did I do okay? And and what? Yeah, and and yeah, and we have to get used to doing two things at the same time. You remember? Got to do two things at once, right? Walk and chew gum. As the church starts growing, we got two things, two or three things going on at the same time, and so it's also work day. Now, tie-dye is at my house, right? So where am I going to be? Yeah. Work day, right? I'd much rather be at work day, <laughs> right? So, and then VBS set up June 10th. Just keep that in mind. Um, we have a lot of kids, right? And so we're working hard to bring kids in, to love on them, show them the love of Jesus, and uh, that's a big part of what VBS is. So work day set up is uh, June 10th. Great, you ready? Yeah, you? If you want to stand with us as we start in worship this morning, please. Come, let us worship our King. Great things, you have done great things. You have done great things. Oh God, you 
do great things. Hey, thank you for picking us up. We had to improvise. Um, sound system wise a little bit this morning after a broken string last night so uh -oh. <coughs> but God is good all the same amen amen So um, years ago, 
And there was a crash on 20 and um, right in front of my brother's house. And um, he ran outside. Um, a girl had crossed over and had rammed someone straight on. And um, he ran outside, he checked on both of the passengers and he, um, the, the girl who had caused the accident had died on the scene so he went to the other girl and kept her awake. He called 911, helped save her life. <laughs> And then um, he never reached out to her. He didn't want to like bring back any trauma. She um, went through a um, getting like metal plates in her leg. She lost her dream of going into the service. Um, she was in her teens, so like this was a rough blow. Um, and then a few months later, she had reached out to my brother and thanked him, and they became friends, and they fell in love. And Calvin, can you show the picture? Last night, he proposed. And I love her, her name is Brooke, um, and my, that, my brother Taylor. Um, but um, I love this story because, I mean, first off, what a great love story. None of this is exaggerated. Like, I'm like, man, you got like the best story to tell people. Um, but what Brooke went through wasn't anything small. She lost her dreams. She lost a normal life um, and has all these plates in her arm and in her leg. I mean, she just, she got so messed up from it. Um, but it really speaks about the beauty that comes from the ashes, right? So um, she, in that moment, probably thought, my life is over. Like, what good can come from this? But... God had a plan all along that she would meet her future husband and her future family. And I mean, this girl is so beloved in our family. Like if they got divorced, I would keep her. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I just, I wanna remind you that if you're going through something, if there's ashes in your life and you don't see how God can make it beautiful, Brooke felt that way too. <laughs> and look at her now, ring on her hand, love of her life with her so there's always beauty that comes from our ashes even if you can't see it just yet um if you're new here um we do have an altar call every sunday if you want to lay something down at jesus's feet we ask that you come and pray you can stay at your seat and pray you can come up to the front and pray and someone will be with you and encourage you you were the word at the beginning one with god the lord most high your hidden glory in creation now revealed in you are christ what a beautiful name Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. Who I could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. 
could not hold you. The veil tore before you. You silenced the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory. For you are raised to life again. You have no rival. You have no Speak to us through Pastor Todd this morning, and that your words would pierce our hearts and change our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. All right. Before I forget, at the end of the service, we're going to take an offering. <laughs> and I'm going to forget then. So thank you so much for your, for you guys always remember and I always forget. And so thank you for your generous support of the church, what we're doing here. You know, we've been in the book of Judges for a while now. And we're going to have, uh, so today and two more, we're going to talk today about uh, the ladies, Deborah and Jael. Um, and then we're going to talk about Gideon next week and then Samson at the, at the end of the series. And so the, Judges is not an easy, warm, fuzzy book, right? It's a story about a society that is in chaos, a, a world that is falling apart where people are being cruel to each other. And the reason behind it, in, at the end of the book, it says everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And that's important because as we look around in the world around us, what do we find? Everyone doing what is right in their own eyes. And when it comes back to, like, what, what does it look like to, to come back and do this? Well, sometimes this, I don't like it because it tells me to love people. That's hard. That's hard sometimes. I mean, come on, have you met people? <laughs> right? Sometimes it's hard to love people. Sometimes it's hard to love the people who are closest to you. <laughs> if you're not sure, that's my, that's my sister. That's my wife. That's my wife. Sorry. That's a biblical thing, right? Calling your wife your sister. It's a thing. All right. Okay, good. You're, you're awake now. All right, good. The culture created by the law of Moses is falling apart. That's what the book of Judges is showing us. It's all about how the culture, you see the, the people came out of Egypt, out of slavery in Egypt. They came into the promised land. They were supposed to remove all of the foreign influences and they didn't. 
And the result of not removing those idols, of not removing those bad influences in their lives is a culture in chaos. And so every time we see this, as, as, as God gives us this picture, it's really the whole book is a warning against allowing idols and false influences in your life. The people of God are incorporating Canaanite practices in their religion. And it's bad. And so the book of Judges starts off with Othniel. And we've, we've got this little picture of Othniel. He's the guy who's the ideal judge. He's the one who's like, okay, God, God tells him to do something. He's like, yes, let's go do it. He's immediately enthusiastic, immediately obedient. And the text of Judges, like it's hard to even tell when Othniel rescues Israel, was it the power of God or the power of Othniel? Yes, it was both. Because God was waiting for Othniel to obey. Great. Ehud, the bold judge, who's also kind of a murderer. <laughs> He's bold, but that's really the only redemptive quality we can find about him. He sneaks into Eglon's chamber and stabs him with a dagger, and Eglon explodes. So today, we're going to look at Deborah, Barak, and Jael. But let's work backwards, just like they do in a murder mystery. Yeah? All right, okay, good. So we're going to start at the end and work backwards. My wife loves murder mysteries, right? And what happens in a murder mystery is you start with someone is dead. That's because that's, murder, right? And you could go back. I almost put a picture of murder she wrote up here, but I knew everybody younger than me would not get it. So I was like... I'm going to do you a favor. And you can tell by the snickers in the room, everybody older than me is like, oh yeah, Murder, She Wrote, that was a great show, Angela Lansbury. And all the young people are like, what is he talking about? But everybody knows Sherlock Holmes, right? Good. Okay, you're with me so far. She loves a good murder mystery, and I love to fall asleep while she watches them. <laughs> because the plot is almost always the same. Someone has died. And you have to figure out how and why that person is dead. So imagine this, okay? Imagine you approach an ancient Middle Eastern tent, and it looks something like this. The technology hasn't changed in thousands of years. They're made of a dark goat hair, and over time, that goat hair will become more waterproof. The sides can be removed, so in the summer when it's hot, you take the sides off and you get a breeze coming through. The interior, would have carpets laid everywhere. Okay, so you have carpets. But there's also kind of um, smells, right? So as you walk into this dark interior, there's kind of smells. Some of them are good smells, you know, perfumes, candles burning, or, you know, oil lamps, oil lamping, um, something cooking. You know, there could be some good cooking smells in there. In this particular instance, we walk in, there's, there's maybe rooms, uh, room dividers inside this, and you go into one of the rooms, and you see a tent peg sticking out of the floor. And under the tent peg, as you sort of lift things up, you find a dead body. Well, how'd he get there? Who is he? The tent peg has been driven through his skull. Dun, dun, dun. Pick up the hammer. Jail kills Sisera. Take a look with me, if you would, please. At chapter 4, starting in verse 17. Now remember, we're starting at the end. We're going to work our way back to the beginning. How did he get there? Why is he dead? Verse 17. Sisera, meanwhile, fled on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite, because there was an alliance between Jabin, king of Hazor, and the family of Heber the Kenite. Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Come, my lord, come right in. Don't be afraid. So he entered her tent, and she covered him with a blanket. Now some translations will say rug. Okay, so he's laying on the floor covered by a rug. I'm thirsty, he said. Please give me some water. She opened a skin of milk, gave him a drink, and covered him up. Stand in the doorway of the tent, he told her. If someone comes by and asks you, is anyone here? Say no. But Jael, Heber's wife, picked up a tent peg and a hammer and went quietly to him while he lay fast asleep, exhausted. She drove the peg through his temple into the ground. 
And I love how scripture like says some of these things, and he died. <laughs> Obviously. Just then, Barak came by in pursuit of Sisera, and Jael went out to meet him. Come, she said, I will show you the man you're looking for. So he went in with her, and there lay Sisera with the tent peg through his temple, dead. <laughs> On that day, God subdued Jabin, king of Canaan, before the Israelites. And the hand of the Israelites pressed harder and harder against Jabin, king of Canaan, until they destroyed him. Pick up the hammer, Jael kills Sisera. Well, who is this guy Sisera? Apart from a guy with a tent peg in his head, it turns out that he's actually a really, really bad guy. He's the commander of Jabin the Canaanites' armies, and these armies have been oppressing the people of Israel for 20 years. Now, when you think about oppression, like, what do you think about, right? Like, harsh words? No, like, beatings murderings, stealing, plundering, robbing. That's oppression. And he's the guy who's been in charge of that for 20 years. Jabin is bad, and Sisera is the guy who's been doing the bad things. At the beginning of chapter 4, we find that. They've been oppressing the, the Israelites for 20 years. Chapter 5 is a song, so we're only going to talk about chapter 4, but in chapter 5, there's a song about this whole event. If you think that gangster rap is a recent invention, it's not, okay? <laughs> they glorify driving a tent peg through this guy's skull in chapter 5 in a song. And at the end of the song, there's a picture of Sisera's mother and what she's waiting for. Flip over to chapter 5. And look at verse 28. So Sisera has gone out to war, and Sisera's mom is waiting at home for him to come back. What is she waiting for? Through the window peered Sisera's mother. Behind the lattice she cried out, Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why is the clatter of his chariots delayed? The wisest of her ladies answer her. Indeed, she keeps saying to herself, are they not finding and dividing the spoils? Oh, they're busy stealing dead people's stuff, the people that they killed in warfare. Keep going. A woman or two for each man, colorful garments as plunder for Sisera, Col colorful garments embroidered, highly embroidered, embroidered garments for my neck, all this as plunder. A woman or two for each man. Now, some translations would translate it a womb or two for each man. And I want you to understand that in the ancient world, when you took over a, another people, you got the people. All the people that did not kill, you got them as slaves and servants. And they're reduced to their reproductive capability in the eyes of Sisera's mother. You would hope that a woman would have compassion on other women, but she has no compassion for the people of Israel. How much less compassion does her son have for these women? So Sisera isn't really an innocent victim. He's bad. He's really bad. He's tent spike through the head bad. Now, Jael is the wife of Heber the Kenite. We find out that he's been killed by Jael, um, and Sisera believed he would be safe in her tent because there was an alliance between the Canaanites and the Kenites. She's married to a Kenite. We don't know like what family she came from or her background. We don't know if she's Israelite or not Israelite. Her husband is not. We are repeatedly told that he's a Kenite. It's difficult to discern Jael's motive. Like, was she mad at him? Did she hate him? Was, had she been victimized by him? We have no idea. All we know is that she killed him. She acts decisively to execute what we come to find is God's judgment on him for oppressing God's people. Jail is the hero. 
but she's not the hero you would expect. You would not expect this calm, peaceful, homebody, tent-dwelling woman to do this. And the whole tent spike thing is a picture in the ancient world, and I don't know how well you can see this, but this is an Egyptian, it's called the Narmer Palette, and this is an Egyptian guy with a hammer in his hand, and you can see there's a victim, and he's holding something that might be a tent spike as he's driving it into his head. So this whole picture of a head-smashing monarch, a victorious monarch, is now applied to this woman who lives in the tent. In the Song of Deborah, there's a contrast between Jael who acted to rescue God's people and some of God's people who sat on the sidelines. So this woman, who's not even a Jewish person, is held up as this hero. And if you look at chapter 5, verse 7, it says this in the song. It says, Villagers in Israel would not fight and held back until I, Deborah, arose. Until I arose a mother in Israel. And so Deborah is the judge, right? She's the one who's, and we'll get more about her in a minute, right? Deborah's the judge. Jael is the hero. And you wouldn't really expect any of these things. What you would expect is that the tribes of Israel would have gotten out of their villages and fought. And they didn't. And behind the scenes of all this is the action of God. The action of God to subdue the Canaanites, chapter 4, 23 says this, uh, chapter 4, verse 23 says, On that day God subdued Jabin, king of the Canaanites, uh, king, king of Canaan before the Israelites. God subdued Jabin. That's the point. God did the work. Behind the scene is, an, is the action of God. There's an idea in psychology called locus of control. And in, in the idea of locus of control, it's either a high external locus of control, where you think that things happen to you and you can't do anything about it, or there's a high internal locus of control where you think something happened, what can I do to change the outcome? And I remember reading, I looked for the source and I couldn't, I couldn't remember the source, but I remember reading about salesmen from the country of India. Now, India, as a culture, are very high external locus of control people. They think that the world influences them. Karma, fate, that's kind of their thing. So how did, how did this happen? Well, can't do anything about it. It just happened. And so someone went in as a consultant. Can you imagine being a salesman with, if you have this high external locus of control? And your boss comes to you and says, why aren't you selling any? We'll use cars. Is that okay? Why aren't you selling any cars? Well, Fate. No, nobody's buying, I guess, you know, can't do anything about it. But if you, what happened, this consultant went in and he trained the Indian salespeople to change their locus of control to an internal locus of control. And they went out and started making phone calls and tracking their numbers. Do you track your salesman numbers? Yeah, a little bit. So the more input they put in, the more phone calls they made, the more contacts they make, you know what they did? They sold more stuff. And they realized, oh, I can change the outcome if I do what I'm supposed to do. I can't imagine having a car dealership full of external locus of control salespeople. That would be very frustrating. But you know, Christians fall into this all the time, right? We count on God so much that we forget that we have to do things. Well, the Lord will handle it. Maybe the Lord's looking for you to handle it, right? I recall one kid, we were working at the Bible college, and this one kid dropped his ice cream. This is a tragedy, right? He dropped his ice cream. And he said, well, I guess the Lord doesn't want me to have ice cream. <laughs> High external locus of control, believing that, now I wish God would smack some ice cream out of my hand from time to time, right? I could drop a few pounds. I'm up three pounds since the ice cream shop opened. Because you know what? I'm a high internal locus of control. I've learned that if ice cream falls out of my hand, I'm going to find some more ice cream. <laughs> you try and stop me. Christians do that all the time. We forget that when we do what God wants us to do, good things happen. God's will happens. We don't sit back and wait. Now, we don't need to go out 
and get mallets and tent spikes and start looking for God's enemies, right? Right? Right, Right. okay, all right, good. The war against the Canaanites was limited in time and in location to those people long ago far away. But certainly God wants us to do his will, to pick up our hammer, metaphorically speaking, and do something. I believe God wants us as followers of Jesus to help other people follow Jesus and trust him for the outcomes, but still be diligent to do what God wants us to do. And on a larger scale for churches to create new churches. That's part of what we're called to do. But in order to do that, we have to pick up the hammer. Now, like looking at our recent context, what's coming up, what's on our near horizon? VBS, right? What can you do? Pray, pray. We want God to move in the kids that show up for VBS, right? We want to trust God that he's going to be actively involved and actively a part of what we're doing here at Shoreline and in VBS. Pray. Invite people. Don't be creepy. Don't cruise through the playgrounds and say, hey, you kids want to go to VBS? (laughs) No, invite kids that you know, right? Volunteer. But here's another thing that you can do. Be patient. You know, we have a, this, this is the worship center, right? That's what our technical definition of this. Do you know what the kids think of this room is? You know what they think it is? It's where they play. This is the room that they play in. So you'll see after service what's going to happen. They're going to just all, all over the place. Be patient. Be patient with them. Because they may not remember everything they learned in children's ministry. They will remember that grouchy old person kept yelling at me when I was running around the playroom. (laughs) As I've gotten older, I am that grouchy old person. Hey, you kids, get off my grass. (laughs) Some of you, like, you felt that a little too... (laughs) That's too natural, I think. Be patient. Be patient with those kids. They'll remember that. Man, my church loved me when I was a kid. And I was, I mean, these kids, they'll grow up and they'll realize, they'll be like, man, I was a little turd. (laughs) I was not looking at you, Lauren. (laughs) I I was, your kids are great. They're high energy though, right? And that, number four, she's a stinker, but anyway. (laughs) Be patient with these little kids and be excited. And we had 30 kids in children's ministry last week. It was chaos. We understand. We get it. It was chaos. But it's a good kind of chaos to have. The church that I came from, we had, you know, a couple kids. It's a hard situation. God's ready to work here. I believe it. Pick up the hammer. Pick up the hammer and obey God. So Jael killed Sisera, right? We're in this murder mystery investigation. Jael killed this man. We found out that there's some political dynamics behind the scenes. This guy was a bad guy. We don't really know what her motive was. Maybe we can find a motive as we work back through the text. Okay, let's go. Chapter 4, verse 11. Looking for answers here. Now Heber the Kenite, Jael's husband, had left the other Kenites, the descendants of Hobab, Moses' brother-in-law, and pitched his tent by the great tree in woe. You ready? Zenanaim, near Kadesh. When they told Sisera that Barak, son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor, Sisera summoned from Harasheth Hagoyim to the Kishon River all his men and his 900 chariots fitted with iron. Then Deborah said to Barak, Go, this is the day the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Has not the Lord gone ahead of you? So Barak went down Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. At Barak's advance, the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and army by the sword, and Sisera got down from his chariot and fled on foot. Barak pursued the chariots and army as far as Harasheth Hagoyim, and all Sisera's troops fell by the sword. Not a man was left. Wow. That's amazing. Go. So Heber the Kenite, 
They separated, and Sisera, at this point, he's alive. He leaves his hometown, Harasheth Hagoyim. He's got 900 chariots. Now, chariots, okay? In the ancient world, the way that chariots were used was that they would fight against you, and when you started losing and running away, they would use the chariots to hunt you down and kill you and then go to your hometown and take all of your stuff, including your family, and bring them home. So they've got the chariots. What is Sisera thinking? He's thinking he's going to win. He's thinking he's going to win because he's got these 900 chariots. And Deborah says this, and Deborah is, we're going to find out more about her. Deborah tells Barak, go, the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. So what does he have to do? Like, could he just, I guess I'll just leave my sword at home. No, he's got to go pick up his sword. He's got to get his 10,000 guys. Hey, guys, bring your swords. We're going to have to go down here. But look, behind the battle is the power of the Almighty God. Okay, sounds good. They completely rout Sisera's army, chased them all the way home. And now you can see. There's the outcome of the command. God has given this army into the hands of the people of Israel. When God commands something, he brings it to pass. And in bringing it to pass, the people of God have an opportunity to be part of his work. Pick up your sword. Was it hard? Sure. I'm sure it was. The victory was won by the sword. They have to do what God commands and trust that he'll do the work behind the scenes. Now, I want to apologize to Carrie Underwood. Jesus doesn't take the wheel. If you know the song, it's a song about a woman who's heading home to Cincinnati. All the country music fans, all the rock and roll people are like, we don't understand. All the country music people are like, we're with you. It's a song about a woman, and she's heading home for Christmas, and she hits black ice, and... She's got a lot on her mind. She's got a lot going on emotionally in her life. And she hits this black ice and she begins to skid out and she throws her hands into the air and she says, yeah, take it from my hands because I can't do this by myself. Yeah, okay, that's the song. Now, as a former professional driver, never take your hands off the wheel. (laughs) Never, don't do it. Mm -mm. And buckle up. That's important too. And if you're praying while you're driving, keep your eyes open. (laughs) By all means, pray when you're driving. Keep your eyes open. Now, the song is this metaphor for her life where things in her life are out of control. She needs to see and feel God's involvement. She needs Jesus' help in that moment. And she's appealing to a high external control. God's circumstances are beyond my control. I can't do it anymore. I need your help. We do that. We feel that all the time. And there are times where, metaphorically speaking, we need somebody or someone to come in and help us. That's the fuel for so much of our prayers. But I think the thing that we need to do is trust God and take action. Counter-steer. Sorry. What are some of God's commands for you? Because God didn't, isn't telling us to go take on Sisera, right? He's not telling us to strap on our sword and take out the enemies of God. He's telling us different things. And so let's just parachute into the New Testament and come up with a couple things that God tells you and I. If you're uh, old enough to be married, what does he say to you wives? Ephesians 5.22. Wives, submit yourselves to your husband as you do to the Lord. Jesus, take the wheel. Take it from my hands because I can't deal with this man anymore right? Or how about Ephesians 5.25, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. I can't do this on my own. This is a rare treat. I don't sing for you often. (laughs) If you want a better marriage, God will help you, but where's God going to start? Because most of the time, you know what we do? Dear God, please change that woman. (laughs) And she prays the other thing. Dear God, please, 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 Dear God, please change that man. We do that. That's high external, right? What's high internal? Dear God, change me. God, change me to be a better husband. 
to sweep the floor when I don't want to sweep the floor because that's what makes her feel loved. To do the dishes when I don't want to do the dishes. To take out the trash when I'm not in the mood. Lord, change me. And you know what happens? The more God works on me, the better this relationship gets. Pretty good, isn't it, honey? <laughs> that was a risky joke. She didn't know it was coming. <laughs> As you obey, God will be with you. As you obey, God will be with you. But I can guarantee if you are not being obedient to what God gives you in his word, he is not with you. And you certainly can't do it on your own. Okay, back to the Old Testament. Pick up the hammer. Deborah didn't say, uh, didn't Deborah just say, the Lord has given Sisera into your hands, but Jael killed him, stealing the honor from Barak. How did we get there? Okay. Pick up the hammer, beginning of the context, and kill your idols. Chapter 4. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, now that Ehud was dead. So the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. Sisera, the commander of his army, was based in Harasheth Hagoyim. Because he had 900 chariots fitted with iron and had cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years, they cried out to the Lord for help. Now Deborah, a prophet, the wife of Lapidoth, was leading Israel at that time. She held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites went up to her to have their disputes decided. She sent for Barak, son of Abinoam, from Kedesh and Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go, take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulun, and lead them up to Mount Tabor. I will lead Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his troops to the Kishon River, and give him into your hands. That's the command of God. To Barak, from the prophet Deborah. Barak said to her, If you go with me, I'll go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. Certainly I will go with you, said Deborah, but because of the course you are taking, the honor will not be yours. For the Lord will deliver Sisera into the hands of a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh. There Barak summoned Zebulun and Naphtali, and 10,000 men went up under his command. Deborah also went up with him. Now the people of Israel... <clears throat> what's the ultimate, like what's happening behind the scenes is that God is continuing to work on his people Israel and they continue to fall into idolatry. This is so frustrating. They keep going back to their idols. They keep rejecting the one true God. So the ultimate cause of Sisera's death is the judgment of God. And the reason that a woman did it is because Barak was not going to get the honor of killing the enemy of the people of God. And we, we know about the sin cycle, right? Judges has this sin cycle that people go through. What's the first step? Idolatry. What's the second step? Oppression. What's the third step? What's the fourth step? Deliverance. Over and over and over. And Judges does it on purpose to get you to think about the warning that is baked into this book. Deborah is a prophet. She speaks on behalf of God to God's people. And there are high standards for a prophet in the Old Testament law. If you look at Deuteronomy, just real quick. Deuteronomy 18, starting in verse 17. The Lord said to me, this is uh, God speaking to Moses. What they say is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their fellow Israelites, and I will put my words in his mouth, his or her. He will tell them everything I command him. I myself will call to account anyone who does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name. So when the prophet says to Barak, go fight, Barak is supposed to say, yes, Lord, and go do it. He doesn't do it. But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything I have not commanded, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, is to be put to death. So Deborah is going to have to tell the truth, right? Or she's going to be killed herself. She has to speak what God tells her, otherwise she forfeits her life. Deborah is the one in this book of Judges who is the most like a modern judge. 
She doesn't lead the tribes to war. She uh, makes decisions and tells people what God says. And the command, the Lord will give Sisera into Barak's hands. Judgment has come on Sisera. It's a done deal. And it would be an honor for Barak to do what God has commanded, right? He would achieve victory. He would achieve status. He would be recognized as obedient to God. Kind of like Othniel, right? Isn't that what God wants from him and from us? Well, I'll go if you want me to. And you know, on one hand, I get it. I mean, how, how many of us would love to have like a road map? Okay, Lord, should I buy this car or that car? We'll just pick one. But I want to know which one is your will. Lord, should I have ice cream or cookies? <laughs> Good Americans, both. But on the other hand, where is his trust in God? He's not like Othniel. He's weak. And in Judges 3.10, it says this, the spirit of the Lord about Othniel, the spirit of the Lord came on him so that he became Israel's judge and went to war. The Lord gave Cushan Rishathaim, king of Aram, into the hands of Othniel who overpowered him. Man, that's what we want to see. Like, wouldn't that be a shorter story? That'd be a short story. God told Barak that Sisera had been delivered into his hands and Barak went out and just, it was done. But no, weak faith. He hesitates. He got into the fight, and here's what's interesting about this text. The reason that Herosheth Hagoyim keeps getting repeated is that Barak is chasing after Sisera, trying to capture the honor for himself. You see, God has already said, a woman is going to receive the honor, and Barak is chasing hard to get the honor for himself because he thinks it's probably Deborah. Deborah is probably going to get the honor. Nope. It's jail. He didn't fully trust God. And the honor didn't come to Deborah. It came to jail, a non-Israelite who took bold action against the enemy of God. Now, working backward through the text, it's the same warning that we've seen, the sin cycle, idolatry, don't have idols. Otherwise, there's going to be oppression. And when you cry out, there will be a deliverer. Why did jail kill Sisera? Ultimately, it's the judgment of God on this very, very bad, wicked oppressor of the people. What's her personal motive? No idea. Why is Sisera oppressing the people of Israel? Idolatry. Again. What's the lesson of the text? Trust God and pick up the hammer. Trust God and pick up the hammer. Whatever is an idol in your life, drive a spike through it. Kill it. Now you might think, Pastor Todd, you're being a little, you're being a little Old Testament right now. I get you. I got you. Colossians 3.5, New Testament. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Oh, look, it's in the New Testament too. Put to death, drive a tent spike through anything that is interrupting your devotion to the one true God. Kill it. Galatians 5.24, those who belong to Christ Jesus, Christians, right, and have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Avoid replacing God with an idol. Radically obey the one true God. As we move into this last move, this, this final thought about application, there's the four questions that we've been using. What is God saying to you from this text? Kill your idols. Kill your idols. Modern idols are things that entice us. Things we trust, things we fear, or things that we need. What do you trust? What do you fear? Beauty can be an idol. I don't know, so if you're, if you're my Facebook friend, yesterday I, I downloaded a filter, and I, I filtered my face, and I tried to make it make me look young. It broke the filter. <laughs> it, it made me look old, 
it, it made me look somewhat younger with a darker beard and whatever, but it broke the filter. It wouldn't make me look young. It kind of made me look scary. Beauty can be an idol. How much time do we invest in trying to make ourselves look better? Health can be an idol. How much time do we spend working out? Or conversely, how much do we spend going to the doctor to try and get better? Beauty, health, money. We trust money not realizing that false gods never fail to fail. We fear danger. The potential for war in Europe or Asia, the next pandemic. There's a whole lot of news about the next pandemic. How can we be ready? It wouldn't be a pandemic if you were ready for it. How can you be ready? Trust Jesus, man. How can you be ready if war is coming? Trust the Lord. How can you be fa- You can be faithful in the middle of anything that comes down the road because that's what God calls you to, to be faithful to him in that moment. To not be afraid today of things that would become an idol to you. Take a spike and drive it through whatever is an idol in your life. What do you need to do about it? Maybe it's a problem best solved with a tent spike, but it might be as simple as changing some of your habits. Maybe you need to turn your phone off and put it away for a while. Ooh. Phone fast. Maybe we could have a phone fast challenge. How would we know who won? Text me when you win. (laughs) What do you need to do about it? You might need to go home and have a hard conversation with your significant other about the idols in your life or the idols in theirs. Oh, that sounds like fun. (laughs) You can do it after Memorial Day weekend. It might involve a hard conversation, but sometimes a hard conversation will lead to a better relationship and to more obedience to God from you, and how can that not result in a blessing? How can we help? Do you need resources to understand things? Do you need a community that will help you obey? Um, I'd love to help you. I'd love to connect you with people who can help you. And then finally, who else needs to hear about it? If God's doing something in your life, who else needs to hear about it? If you've gotten rid of the idols in your life, who else needs to hear about it? As the team comes up, it's gotten warm. Thanks for toughing it out. Don't forget the offering. Um, There are a number of ways that you can support the church. Uh, Obviously, we need, you know, volunteers and help. We do need money. Um, And so the guys will come around with a basket. There's also a black box out here in the hallway. Uh, You can give online. There's a number of different ways you can support the work of the church. Um, I'm just always so thankful. Uh, I'm thankful for being able to be here. And I'm so thankful for your support of the church and all the good things that are going to open up here in the future for Shoreline. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you so much for all that you've given us. Watch over us today. Be glorified, Father, in our work as a church, Lord, and help us, Father, to remove the idols from our life. We thank you, Lord, for all that you've done in Christ's name. Amen. You can stand as we get ready, but be a little patient.
the affections of a father who will never let them go. Rejoice, come and lift your hands and raise your voice. Sing unworthy of our praise. Rejoice, sing the mercies of your King and with tremble. Enjoy your weekend, and we'll see you next week.